I'm going to talk to you today about how we might reduce identity theft with verifiable credentials. Now you're all familiar with plastic cards. Uh, you have lots of them in your pocket. I know I have a pocket full that I carry around with me. And they authorise me to do all sorts of different things. I can drive a car with them. I can buy alcohol by proving I'm over 18, although usually I don't need to with my grey hair. Um, I can get discount on train tickets. I get the senior one, you get the student one. Uh, I get Tesco club card points by using a card. Uh, and when I'm walking around campus, I can prove that I should be here uh, by showing my Kent ID card. The list is endless. And those plastic cards are really absolutely invaluable. We can't do without them. But what about uh, when it comes to the electronic world? Well, in the electronic world, we don't have the equivalent. And this is what my research has been, uh, been doing. So how many authorization attributes are on a plastic card? Typically, even though it looks to be full of information, there's only one or two attributes that are on a card. Uh, for example, in the club card case, uh, there's just that you're a Tesco club card member. Uh, in the visa card case, it's just that you've got a visa card. Uh, the University of Kent, actually, it's two attributes. It says that you're a, a staff or a student, and it also says which department you're in. Uh, a driving license is a bit different because it's got quite a lot of information on there. It's got your date of birth, your address, and the class of the vehicle you can drive. But that's rather special. Uh, and the rest of the information on the plastic card actually is only there to help the, the person who's getting the card to, to validate it. So it's got a picture of you or your signature so they can authenticate you. It has the name of the, of the issuer and it has the validity time of the card and a unique number. And, and all that information I say is there, not for the authorization purposes, but for the authentication purposes of the card itself. Now, what is identity theft? Identity theft, it's obtaining uh, things from people or from banks or wherever by using wrong identity information, typically for economic gain. Here's a couple of examples. We've got a couple of people in California and they tapped into their neighbor's uh, wireless lands, stole personal information, and by the time they were uh, caught, 30 victims had been, uh, been affected by them. There's another lady here who worked for the US Internal Revenue Service, uh, and she was copying data from, from the internal revenue computers, names, dates of birth, and things like that. And she stole nearly half a million dollars uh, from people through identity theft. And it's a massive problem and rising. Uh, the latest figures I've got for, for 2005, uh, that it's risen by 31% uh, over the equivalent in period of 2014. And in 2014, it was nearly $16 billion that was stolen in the US. So you can see it's a massive problem. Now, why is it so easy? to perform identity theft? The answer is because when you send information across the internet, you typically just enter it in and people believe it. Uh, there's nothing there to actually prove that it's correct. And so you can actually more or less send whatever information you want across the internet and people will believe it. And so masquerade is very, very easy. Here's an example. I configured up my Thunderbird email system to say that I was His Royal Highness Prince Philip. Um, and then I sent a, an email to myself, because I know David Chariot is very gullible, uh, asking him for some personal information. So here, here's the example. I set up this spoof email saying it's uh, from Her, His Royal Highness F Prince Philip, and I invent a, an email address which looks plausible uh, at, the, uh, at uh, Buckingham Palace. But then just in case the person sends a reply, and it's obviously not going to work, I put my own reply address in, which is some address I've invented at, at Gmail, and therefore I'll get, the, I'll get the message if he sends a reply. And then I create a message to him and I say, look, you're invited to the garden party uh, and if you'd like to come, send me a copy of your passport so security can validate you when you arrive that you're actually genuinely David Chadwick. And if, uh, if I'm gullible, I'll send off my passport details to this person and then they can use it for identity theft. So what's the solution? The solution is websites should not accept identity information that isn't cryptographically protected. Uh, that isn't secured by someone they trust, so that when they receive the information, they can say, this information is cryptographically protected, it's digitally signed by someone I trust, I therefore know it's genuine. And ideally, we would like to bind this cryptographic protection to the, to the owner via biometrics, so that the, the credentials can only be released to a website if the person has proved it's him via his biometrics. And then we have the electronic equivalent of plastic cards on our computer or on our smartphone that we can send off to different websites. Only now it's more secure than plastic cards because they, they're actually much more difficult to copy than plastic cards. 
Uh, and also they're more privacy protecting because we don't need to send our photo, our name and all the other information or our signature anymore because the, the cryptographic protection is enough to authenticate the credentials. And this is actually work that's been carried out by the W3C in the Verifiable Credentials Community Group of which I've been a member and participating. Here is the, here's the model uh, for verifiable credentials. On the left hand side we have the issuer. This is the authority, the attribute authority that's going to give people credentials to say they're a student at Kent or they're a visa card holder or they're entitled to a rail card uh, discount or something like that. In the middle we have the person, that's you, the holder, and you've got some software running on your behalf that will interface with the different components of the system and will store your credentials in a repository for you to pick up and use when you want. It will register a unique identifier for you in a registry and that unique identifier is what's used when you go to the website. It says the, the, the entity with this unique identifier has these attributes so you don't need to say who you are, you just need to give the attribute that authorises you to, to do something. And the website has its inspector code there that will verify the credential, will, will check the digital signature, make sure it's signed by the issuer that it trusts and it says I now know that I've got information from a trusted source and that it belongs to this, this particular person. Now Fast Identity Online, FIDO, is some work that's been going on for a few years by the, the FIDO Alliance, which is, a, which is an industry consortium uh, made up of mobile phone producers and Google and, and other, other large companies like that. And they are providing strong authentication. You'll find this system now is operational in all the latest mobile phones. Um, and uh, you, you, so some of you probably already have the FIDO software in your mobile phone. And what FIDO does is it creates a key pair for every website you go to and that key pair is then used to authenticate you on subsequent visits to the website. So you never need a password, uh, you can forget about remembering passwords anymore because Fido replaces passwords with cryptographic keys. In order to access the keys on your mobile phone you have to strike your finger or your iris scan or whatever you, your phone needs to unlock it and then when you unlock the phone the phone will unlock the keys and send them to the website. This is a picture of the UAF architecture, the FIDO UAF architecture. I'm not going to go into details now, but you can see the essential components are that the person must authenticate to the phone using their biometric uh, or, or a PIN or password, whatever the phone supports. The phone holds the keys and it sends the, the public key to the website and then it digitally signs messages to the website to prove it's you every time you, you go to the website. Now the website doesn't know who you are, all it knows is it's the same person that came last time that's coming again because I've got a digital signature from, from that phone. Therein is the problem. It only provides authentication. It doesn't authorise you to do anything. It just tells the website it's the same person who came last time. So the work I've been doing is to add authorization to Fido so that using the same system we can also authenticate to the website and then we can send attributes to say these attributes belong to me, I'm a student at Kent or I'm staff at Kent and it will authorise me then to, to have uh, services from the website. So this, so this is a picture of our authorisation model, very similar to the authentication model but with extra components added. Uh, you'll see now on the right hand side there are two websites. One of the websites is the one that issues the credential to you which you store on your phone and the other website is the one that receives the credential and the validating website can check the signature on the credential to make sure it was signed by the issuing website and then it knows it's a genuine credential come from a trusted issuer. Now this has been implemented by colleagues of mine at the University of Paul Sabatier in Toulouse who I've been working with for a number of years and they've implemented it on a Google Nexus 5X phone using Android 6 and it's based on some software provided by eBay uh, and using the Spring framework. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you how it works in practice using a typical use case that is of uh, value to you. It's uh, buying a pizza from a shop in town, a takeaway pizza and getting them to deliver it to the student accommodation and proving online that you are a student at the University of Kent and that you can indeed pay for the pizza because on your phone you will have a student credential issued by the University of Kent and you'll have a visa credential issued by a bank. So the first step when you get your mobile phone is you have to register your mobile phone with the issuer to say this is my mobile phone and I want you to issue credentials to me on this mobile phone. And uh, when, when you come to Kent you'd, you, you'd register as a student and they would give you a piece of paper and on that piece of paper would be a one-time password. You'd then go to the University of Kent website, you'd uh, type in the one-time password, the phone would generate a key pair, send it to the website and the website would say okay this key pair goes with this one-time password, we know, it's, we know it's you, therefore we know that every time you come back to the website with this key pair we know who it is. 
Of course, you have to strike your finger on the phone to authorise the issuing of the key pair. That's, that's to protect you so that if anybody steals your mobile phone, they can't actually use your credentials because they don't have your finger and they can't actually unlock the credentials in your mobile phone. After you've uh, sent this information through to the website, uh, in this case the university, the university then says, well, which attributes that we hold about you do you want us to issue? In this particular case, the university says, I could, I could tell them that you've got a degree or I can tell them that you're a student. And in this case, uh, we've ticked to say, I, I just want the student uh, attribute to be issued uh, to, uh, to people as verifiable credentials. The next step is you go to the other issuers. So you might go to the bank to get a visa credential. You might go to PalPay to get some payment credential. You might go to the uh, train line company to, to get a, a discount card. Uh, whatever you do, you do it once only. Um, this is the registration step. It's only needed so that you can actually register with the website to say, uh, with the issuer to say, this, this is me, this is my phone. These are the keys I'm going to use to talk to you. And of course that has to be done in a strong uh, secure manner because if anybody can masquerade as you at the registration time they can obviously steal your verifiable credentials but this is only done initially now once you've got all your credentials on your phone then you can go out doing your shopping around the internet in a, in a provable secure manner so in this case we go to the pizza website and uh, we look around at the different food that's on offer we decide what we want and then we say we're going to uh, connect with fido so now, because we said we want to connect with Fido, the mobile phone asks us, are we giving our permission for a new key pair to be generated at the pizza website? So I strike my finger on the phone, that allows the, uh, the phone to create a new key pair, the public key is sent to the, to the web, web, website, and every time I go back to the pizza website, now it knows who I am, because it's got the, it's got the uh, public key that it can match with the signatures that my phone will send. Next, I place my order, and in this case, I'm ticking to say I'm a student. Now you'll notice today on websites, you tick these boxes and there's no proof. There's no way of proving that you're a student. They just, the website just has to believe that you are. But in this particular case, because the website is using verifiable credentials, you've said you're a student, so it can get proof. So the website sends its policy to the phone to say, in order for you to get a discount, I need you to prove to me that you're a student and I also need a means of uh, payment. And it just so happened we have two means of payment. We've got the, the PalPay payment and we've got the Visa payment and I can choose which one I want to use in this particular case. After choosing which one I want to use, I then have to authorise the phone to issue the keys to the issuer to say that uh, we want the credentials to be collected and put on the phone specifically for the pizzeria because every website has its own key pair we have to get specific credentials issued for this website so i authorize that uh, the pizzeria verifies the credentials and then it sends back to me a confirmation of the transaction so um, it says you're you're going to buy this pizza and you're getting this discount are you sure you want to go ahead i say yes i do want to go ahead i know to sign the message to say i want to, con to, to complete the transaction i have to strike my finger again and then it all works and now we've got a mechanism that is provably secure, uh, that is very difficult to forge or break into, and the, and the website knows you're a student because it got the verifiable credential, and it knows you can pay because it got the, it got the visa credential from the bank. So looking at the comparison of plastic cards and verifiable credentials, Plastic cards are good, but they don't protect your privacy because they give away your identity, maybe your photo, your, your, your signature and other things to, to prove the card belongs to you. We don't need this with verifiable credentials because the key pair is used, is used to verify you and to prove that the credential belongs to you. So they're privacy protecting. The details from plastic cards can be copied and indeed are copied and, and false cards are made uh, and used by others. Verifiable credentials can be copied by anyone but they can only be used by the owner of the mobile phone because the owner of the mobile phone has to authorise that they're going to be uh, sent to the website and that they're going to be signed by the key in the website to prove that they belong to him. So they're, they're, they're much more secure than plastic cards. It takes several days to issue pl plastic cards, credentials can be issued instantly. Uh, Carrying plastic cards around in your wallet is just more stuff to be stolen and lost. Whereas here you're carrying your mobile phone, everything's on your mobile phone and, and you need to worry about your mobile phone. Uh, if it's stolen, you can revoke uh, plastic cards. Well, of course, you can revoke uh, credentials as well. The one thing you have to be, be sure of is your mobile phone is protected. So if someone steals your mobile phone, they can't unlock it. So that's why it's wise to have a mobile phone with fingerprint reader or something similar. So conclusions. It's very hard to perform identity theft with verifiable credentials. You'd need to trick every attribute authority into uh, issuing you a credential on behalf of someone else before that person does it, 
or you'd have to steal the user's phone and his finger in order to actually unlock the credentials that are on the phone. So we believe this is a very good way of going forward with uh, transactions in a secure manner to help prevent identity theft. I'd like to finish by acknowledging all my colleagues at Toulouse who worked with me on this implementation. That's thanks to Roman, Arno, Remy and Samer. Thank you guys for, for that. And I'd also like to thank the audience for attending. I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Goodbye. <laughs>